my great honor now to introduce our next speaker, Victor Andres Triay, teaches at uh, Middlesex Community College, uh, about 25 miles north of where I live, I'm less than that, I think. So we're neighbors in Connecticut, two Connecticut Cubans. Victor uh, also needs no introduction, no lengthy introduction anyway. Uh, his first book on Operation Pedro Pan uh, cracked the ice, cracked the silence, and opened up uh, an area that um, w was, was not there before. His second book, uh, Oral History of the Bay of Pigs, also made great headway in breaking the silence and, and correcting many things that uh, are misperceptions in the broader culture. And he's here to, today to speak to us about Operation Pedro Pan, from small plant to largest children's exodus in the Western Hemisphere. Big time. Okay, so now I have to follow Carlos twice. Um, his introduction to me is probably then my talk is going through. I also am in the unfortunate position that I am when I teach 11 o'clock classes that everybody starts getting hungry. Um, so if, if, you know, if you want to get up and eat something, I guess, um, I don't know if anything's available. Um, but thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I have the same problem uh, Carlos has that he talked about, that I've given a lot of talks on Operation Pedro Pan, and usually the people in the audience know nothing. Do um, you mind if I move this just a little bit? I talk loud anyway. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, beautiful. Um, most of the people in the audience know nothing, so I have to start from scratch and, you know, from step one, and I can go in and out. But of course today, um, not only, uh, well, I mean, first of all, this is a room full of people who know about the program, and we're actually participants in the program. This is only a program that I've studied, so I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who know a great deal more than I do, so I'll, I'll do my best um, to do what I'm supposed to do, which is just to give a brief uh, history of the program. Uh, the second problem is that I have only half an hour. I could probably go on for about three weeks if I were to give a, comp a very comprehensive history. So um, when I sat down to decide what to talk about, I, I very quickly learned that I had to decide what not to talk about. So there's going to be a great deal that I'm not going to mention, and certainly you'll have the opportunity at the question and answer session to ask any questions, any follow-up questions, or, or if you want me to address something uh, that I didn't discuss. Anyhow, so I'm going to look at the program from the point of view of Miami, of Father Walsh, of, of some of the things going on in Cuba, and if I have time, go into a few other areas. So I guess the best place to start is, is in Miami, right? This great, huge city that you see through these windows uh, at the time was, to say the least, much smaller. Um, the first wave of Cubans that started coming after 1959 was relatively small, a few Batista people, a few others, but by the time the revolution radicalized by the time the, the, the turn to communism came. As you all know, that small trickle is going to turn into a giant wave by the end of 1960. It's estimated, and I've seen different numbers, but I'll go with this one. Uh, there are probably around 60,000 Cuban exiles in Miami. Uh, by this time, many of the restrictions had, had been applied. Uh, many of them came with very little, and that put a big burden on all the different social service agencies in Miami, private and public. Now, among the social service agencies, one of them that, that wasn't touched quite as early as some of the other ones was the Catholic Welfare Bureau. And the Catholic Welfare Bureau was headed up by then Father uh, Brian Walsh. We we're so used to calling him Monsignor Walsh that we forget that he wasn't Monsignor at the time. Um, Father Walsh was born in Ireland. He graduated from St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore in 1954, and as a young man uh, was made uh, the head of the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami. Uh, I, I would imagine of the Diocese of Miami, then I'm not sure if it was an archdiocese yet. And, you know, one of the fun things about <coughs> discussing history, and I do it every day, and I teach a lot, and I teach every day, um, is when you get these people who are just, you know, kind of going along a certain path, and then all of a sudden, everything changes on them, which is why I, I, don't, I don't trust uh, trajectories when we're talking about stocks. Well, the economy is going to grow this much in 10 years based on recent, because you never know what's going to happen. The Catholic Welfare Bureau at the time was small. 
uh, it was a, a child care and adoption agency that had around <coughs> 80 children under its care. That's 80. Now, remember, there's about to be uh, you know, 7,000 uh, who are going to be put under its care very soon. Anyhow, Walsh could imagine what was coming. He saw what was going on at the other social service agencies. He suspected that there might come the day when an unaccompanied child was brought to him, and probably more than just one. And well, that finally happened in November 1960, which a lot of things are going to happen in November, December, and January that are going to determine what happens from here on out. Um, they brought him a 15-year-old boy, Pedro. Uh, Pedro had been sent by his parents uh, out of Cuba to escape communist brainwashing, to keep him out of trouble. Of course, one of the big motives for sending teenage boys is that a lot of them were getting themselves in trouble, uh, you know, joining this resistance group or that. And, 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 you know, I think in Cuba, people were used to sort of that being a big game, right? You were in high school, you were at the university, you joined this group, you, you conspire, right? You know, you always it was a great thing to conspire. And if you got caught, not a whole lot happened to you probably. It depends at what level you were conspiring, I suppose. But this was turning much more serious now, and people were being killed. And so I would imagine it was for that reason his parents sent him, and if not him, certainly a lot of others. Um, he had lost 20 pounds. He, he was sent to relatives in Miami by his parents. The relatives couldn't take care of him, and he ended up on the street. And Walsh said of him, and I quote, it was a scared and hungry child that stood in my office that November afternoon. And Walsh saw this as a sign of things to come, and Walsh started thinking, I better start getting ready, because we might have an explosion of cases. And, and within a few days came a report from Key West that some Cuban parents had shown up with their son and asked the judge to take temporary custody or asked him to find a family because they were fighting against Castro and wanted him out of the country. So this was, this all of a sudden started, and, and, and Walsh perceived correctly uh, that this was going to grow. I don't think he could have imagined that it was going to grow um, to the point that it did. Anyhow, meanwhile, local leaders in Miami, as you might imagine, were, were alarmed by the number of Cubans showing up, and it didn't look like it was going to stop. And like always with an immigration problem, there's, there's the local angle, and local agencies, local people who have to deal with immigration issues, but of course immigration is a federal problem. And so naturally, some citizens in Miami formed a committee, um, the Cuban Refugee Executive Committee, and the, the goal was to talk to the administration, to the Eisenhower administration, to ask them, we need guidance here, and we need money. And of course, what was always primary on their minds was, we need to relocate these people. Is, is there anywhere else we could put them besides Miami? Um, of course, it, it didn't work. But, um, but, uh, but Eisenhower did send a representative, a special representative, uh, Tracy Voorhees, uh, to come to Miami to check out the situation, to make an assessment, and to report back to him. And Voorhees came, he met with the Cuban Refugee um, Executive Committee. He, uh, Voorhees had also headed the Hungarian Relief Program uh, in 1956 in, at Kent Kilmer, New Jersey, so he had some experience in this. Well, when Walsh found out Voorhees was coming, Walsh immediately went into action. He, he called for, a, for, for an emergency meeting of the Child Care Division of Miami's Welfare Planning Council, which is sort of the group that comes together to try to predict what the social problems are going to be, how they, these agencies are going to address them. And he was there with a plan. Uh, he was ready. Uh, he unveiled a plan uh, that would use federal money, public money, channeled to local, private, charitable organizations to care for any unaccompanied children that might come, besides the, the, the few who were there. Uh, the re and, and of course, those private agencies would be religious agencies, and he wanted it to be religious agencies because unlike a boarding school, you're actually going perhaps into a foster care situation or to a home, situa or, or to a home situation, and of course, they were they're, they're mostly Catholics in Cuba, but also Jews, Protestants, and those parents who sent children in, in, here in that context would obviously prefer them to be with someone of their faith. And so the different groups agreed, which included groups from all those faiths, and so the Welfare Planning Council put their plan together, gave it to the Cuban Refugee Executive Committee, who presented it to Tracy Voorhees when he finally came to Miami. And so Voorhees knew this was going on. Um, Voorhees reported to President Eisenhower, and the administration agreed, not just the children's part, but the overall refugee part, to provide a million dollars immediately <coughs> to alleviate the situation in Miami. The Cuban Refugee Center opened um, within days almost. And on the children part, on the, on the part of the children, they're, they're, it, it was kind of vague. It said, well, if the problem of unaccompanied minors 
becomes drastic enough so that the private agencies can't handle it themselves, and then we'll send some money. And so this was the situation. This laid the groundwork for what would later become the Cuban Children's Program, which we'll discuss in just a few minutes. Now, meanwhile, on the topic of unaccompanied Cuban children, what Walsh couldn't have known while Walsh was meeting with, with Pedro on the Welfare Planning Council, Walsh's plan was just to you know, basically wait for unaccompanied children to show up. It, how, when, he wasn't sure, but they had to be ready. But meanwhile, in Havana, uh, there was actually movement in that area. Um, James Baker, whose son Chris is here today, uh, was the head, he, he was the headmaster of Ruston Academy. Uh, James Baker had gone to Ruston in 1930 as a teacher, and he taught there till 1936. In 1944, he went back to Cuba and took over the school's administration when Aaron Ruston, the founder, died, and then his wife, Sybil, died, and they took over the school. Uh, Mr. Baker, like many Ruston parents of the Ruston community, was very excited that Batista had been overthrown, but very soon became disillusioned with the revolution and the turn it was taking toward communism, and thus he, along with other people in Ruston, uh, became connected to the people who were actually now fighting Castro, which were many of the same people who um, were, of course, like the rest of the nation, uh, <coughs> gleeful at first. Anyhow, there were many parents who were concerned that if they entered the underground, what would happen to their children. Uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I think is significant is the experience of the Spanish Civil War. If the Spanish Civil War was still relatively fresh, and a lot of the atrocities committed during that war, and a lot of parents said, we want our children out. So they came up with a plan whereby Mr. Baker would travel to Miami and try and establish a temporary boarding school for around 200 children, um, mostly of underground activists. And so he came to Miami uh, at the end of 1959. Um, he solicited American businessmen who had previously been in Havana for funds for this, and then set about finding a place for these children. His idea was to establish a boarding school, right? You know, a temporary boarding school while this thing worked itself out in Cuba. And as he was doing this, somebody recommended that he speak to Father Walsh, because Father Walsh was also concerned about Cuban children and, and, and unaccompanied children coming over as part of this. So Walsh and Baker met, and Walsh immediately convinced Mr. Baker to drop his idea of a boarding school. There were all sorts of problems with the idea, he told him. He told him, first of all, look, you're bringing over unaccompanied children, that's great. There's federal money promised for them. If we bring over a certain amount, the federal government will provide funds. Uh, also, we have a plan for their care with licensed agencies in case they show up. Uh, and of course, there's the religious issue. So in other words, Father Walsh already had a plan. He already had a structure in case unaccompanied children, which of course solved Baker's problem completely, and, and, and Mr. Baker had nothing uh, but nice things to say about uh, Father Walsh, and of course he did solve a big problem for him. So now the groundwork is laid, at least in the embryonic stage, for Operation Pedro Pan uh, and for the Cuban Children's Program. Again, at the time nobody could imagine it would turn into what it turned into. But Walsh's role also changed, because Walsh now was no longer going to be in his office waiting for the phone to ring about an unaccompanied child. He was actually now working with someone inside of Cuba who would be sending unaccompanied children, and he would meet them at the point of entry at Miami International Airport. And of course, those 200 children will turn into 14,000 very quickly. Um, anyway, and not only that, but Monsignor Walsh, or Father Walsh at the time, also played a role in the whole process of bringing the children out. And b because the original plan, remember the, the embassy was still open at this time. Commercial flights were still going back and forth. So the plan was this. They would bring these children over, whoever Mr. Baker designated, as students, officially, for visa requirements. The idea was that Mr. Baker, when he went back to Cuba, would send Father Walsh <coughs> lists of children's names. Well, first of all, Mr. Baker went back to Cuba with a letter from, from, from Father Walsh, because the embassy required two things, a U.S. embassy. First, proof of enrollment at a school, if a child is going to be given a student visa, and secondly, an acceptable person or agency that would be responsible for them. The second one was solved by Father Walsh right away. He, he wrote a letter saying that the Catholic Welfare Bureau would accept responsibility for any child Mr. Baker designated. As far as the actual uh, proof of enrollment, that would have to be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So when Mr. Baker went back to Cuba, the plan was Mr. Baker would send Father Walsh the list of the students. Father Walsh had a whole system established that he devised, 
um, to get student visas for them in the proof of enrollment from Coral Gables High School. And then, of course, so the, they had the letter, they would have proof of enrollment, and then, of course, money from those same businessmen that Mr. Baker met with earlier. Walsh devised this whole system where they would make checks to the Catholic Welfare Bureau. The Catholic Welfare Bureau would make checks uh, to, pro to select private citizens in Miami who would then send personal checks to a travel agency in Havana. So it was all very intricate, but it didn't last very long. Um, at any rate, uh, Mr. Baker went back to Cuba, and two days later, this is December 1960, Father Walsh received a list with 125 names. So very possibly 125 children were coming and there was no place to put them. And so Walsh is already driving around Miami wondering, what am I gonna do? And as he's driving, not too far from here, on the other side of the bay, he drove by Assumption Academy, an all-girls board, Catholic boarding school. And he thought, they're on Christmas vacation. <laughs> Hello, sister, how are you? Uh, and he met with the, with the mother superior there, and he, he pleaded his case. And of course, she very graciously said, yes, you can bring all the children you want. They could use the rooms here while the girls are away, but they have to be out by January 6th. He said, no problem. Um, at least I'm good till January 6th. But they didn't know if 125 children were going to show up at once, uh, if they were going to come over several days. And there was reason to think they'd all come at once, because you know how these dates were. On this anniversary, they're going to make some incredible announcement of, of, about some new policy that's radically going to change everybody's life. And sometimes they made those announcements, and sometimes they were rumors. And the rumor going around that on January 1st, the anniversary of the revolution, Castro was going to announce that no more children were allowed to leave Cuba. Right? And that was the rumor. That that's, that's what everybody was working under. So Father Walsh was thinking they're all going to be sent before January 1st. And he received right before or rather on Christmas Eve, uh, Father Walsh got a call saying that the first children would be arriving the next day on Christmas. He didn't know if it was going to be five or a hundred. He had no clue. So he and uh, Louise Cooper went to Miami International Airport to wait for the flights from Cuba, and, and he wrote about this. I mean, if you stop and think, six weeks earlier, he was the head of the Catholic Welfare Bureau, in what was then a small diocese, because not only was Miami not as big as it is today, but there weren't that many Catholics here, taking care of 80 children. All of a sudden, he's involved in this whole secret. He, he was communicating with Mr. Baker via the diplomatic pouch, because there was this whole secretive aspect. I mean, his entire role in life radically changed within six weeks. And he wrote about this, about waiting at the airport that day. He said, quote, uh, by this time, we ourselves became emotionally involved. Sorry, I can't read with my glasses anymore. I'm getting old. Um, in the race against the January 1st deadline. No longer were we simply a social agency concerned about a community problem. We were now sharing the worries of families we did not even know, hundreds of miles away, in a life and death struggle in the Cold War. Our excitement rose as the time drew near for the, uh, for the first of the flights to arrive. I mean, you can imagine his emotional state. Now, no flights came that day with children, but Walsh was able to work out arrangements with the INS telling them there are going to be children coming relationships that are going to uh, last for the duration of Operation Pedro Pan. Anyway, the following day, December 26, uh, the first children showed up asking for Father Walsh, uh, brother and sister um, Sixto and Vivian Aquino. Um, over the next several days, more and more children came in asking for Father Walsh, and Walsh asked for the money from Tracy Voorhees, said it's beyond our ability to deal with it fork over the federal money. And of course it's going to take a little while, but, but it will get there. But one of the things that, and, and, and when I teach my history class, I always say, well, you know, sometimes you're going down this way and all of a sudden some other question comes up or some avenue opens that nobody expected. And it started out innocently enough, um, Walsh's whole relationship with the State Department. None of the children that had come during that last week in December um, had come with a student visa, even though Walsh had sent them. And so finally Mr. Baker called Father Walsh, which they agreed to only communicate via the diplomatic pouch, but it was urgent, and told him that the embassy was, I mean most of the children had shown up with tourist visas, remember the embassy was still open, or, or, or other means, or other documentation. Um, but Mr. Baker explained to Father Walsh that the problem was that the embassy was holding up the application. Uh, and they were holding them up because the letter Walsh had sent, accepting responsibility, um, maybe needed to have more to it. And he was told to call uh, Frank Auerbach, Frank Auerbach at the State Department in Washington. 
uh, to solve this problem. And so Father Walsh called Mr. Auerbach, and Mr. Auerbach said, well, Father, I mean, that's all well and good, but we need something more. We need an agency. We need an agency to accept ultimate responsibility for the children, right? And so I, I would imagine Father Walsh said, well, what do you need? He said, well, we need a letter that says this, this, and this. And of course, this had to be done right away. And so Father Walsh, very low on the church hierarchy, not of the great prestige he had later, he was still a young man, uh, without consulting his superiors, which he was you know, a little bit nervous about, went ahead and wrote this letter to uh, Frank Auerbach. <laughs> And this was a bold decision. I mean, you know, I mean, the, this, 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 and then of course, not too long after that, I mean, remember there were no cell phones or text messaging then. If you weren't by a phone, you didn't get a message. Uh, apparently, uh, somebody was trying to call Father Walsh from Washington during these hours, and they got the bishop instead. <laughs> and, well, and Walsh, and, and this is Walsh from his interview with me. Uh, quote, one day I came back to my apartment and the archbishop was calling. Where have you been? I've been trying to call you all day. So I said, probably a typical Walsh answer, um, I've been doing your work. <laughs> so, what's going on? You know, just saying, oh, well, nice to hear from you. Uh, uh, the archbishop, or, or the uh, bishop said, uh, this fellow from the State Department, Auerbach, has been trying to call you and somehow uh, uh, he got a hold of me. He wants to talk to you about some children from Cuba. And Walsh said, uh, oh yeah, I know what that's about. <laughs> and of course Walsh was feeling a great sense of consternation. Um, wasn't sure how the bishop, who was, you know, had, had, from all accounts, had his personality, um, might view the situation. And of course, uh, Walsh now heard the bishop's regular. I mean, the bishop hadn't even consulted on a lot of this. And so Walsh tells the story, he says, quote, so here I am thinking in the back of my mind, how am I going to tell him that I went out on this limb? My career's finished, uh, but it's worth it for 200 kids. And, and so Walsh said, oh yes, Archbishop, that's right. And the Archbishop said, are you limiting? Did you put that limit of 200? Walsh said, uh, no, Archbishop. And, and then Walsh said, it was the fastest thing the guy ever did. So Walsh said, I'm not putting any limit on the number of children. That's just 200 on the first list. And the Bishop said, that's right. Take all the kids. Take everyone. Don't be restricting them. You're always restricting. <laughs> You're always saying no. <laughs> and of course, now we had the back end. And, and whenever I read that quote, I, I think of the nuns that, that educated me. They, they told you characteristics about yourself that you'd never displayed. Um, and later you find out they were probably right somehow. Uh, but anyway, he did have uh, the backing and, uh, of, of the diocese. But anyway, um, meanwhile, um, within the next few days, one way or another, the embassies closed. And the whole plan of student visas went by the wayside because the conventional means of getting documentation, of course, ended. There was no U.S. Embassy in Havana any longer. And Mr. Baker left Cuba upon the closing of the embassy. Um, and as far as anybody knew, it was over. That's it, the whole thing to get children out of Cuba. Uh, who, who couldn't live with their families for one reason or another. And I want to emphasize that because there were a lot of families leaving Cuba, um, but you know these were th those special cases. Uh, but Mr. Baker knew it would continue because Mr. Baker had a plan to continue doing this. Uh, Mr. Baker had left the secret committee in Cuba to keep the program going. Uh, some of these people were very well connected people, people connected not just to Ruston, but the higher levels in the, in the, in the diplomatic corps, etc. And the plan was that this secret committee uh, in Havana would use their connections with embassies, international airlines, etc. Um, to get the children visas to fly to Jamaica, right, which is then still part of the British Commonwealth, or the British Empire, or whatever it was called at that moment, right? There, 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 were, there were still commercial flights to Miami, what there wasn't were the documents. You couldn't get the documents. So, what you needed were British documents. The idea was that a child would be put on a plane bound for Jamaica. There were two flights to Jamaica every week. One went um, Havana, Miami, Kingston. If the children were on that flight, on the, when they landed in Miami for a layover, they'd just get out of the plane. That was it. If it went to Kingston first, it would go Havana, Kingston, right, where the children would uh, uh, get out there. and. Of course, they could get their visas to come to the United States in Kingston. So that was the idea 
um, going in. And of course, Walsh told, uh, uh, Baker told Walsh of this, of this idea. Of course, there were connections on that committee through the Finlays, uh, to KLM Airlines, to the Dutch Embassy, all of which would play a significant role later. Anyhow, so they called this Auerbach fellow, the same Frank Auerbach, uh, at the State Department, and they said, look, um, we have this plan for Jamaica. Uh, could we continue this? You know, oh, it's going to have to change and, and, and whatnot. So Auerbach um, said, sure, uh, let's talk about it. Come to Washington. So Father Walsh went to Washington. Father Walsh was supposed to go to Washington for a White House um, conference on, on the aging. And so he was going to be there anyway. And so uh, he immediately jumped on an airplane and flew to Washington, D.C. Um, of course, now he's even in much deeper. I mean, I mean, this is six weeks separating him from leading a small child care agency in a, in, a, in, a, in a small diocese in a place that was then considered part of the boondocks. And here he is in Washington sitting down with the State Department, and, and he wrote about that um, uh, as well. Um, let's see, i has got to find it. Right, he, he wrote, it was a bright, cold winter afternoon and the streets around the State Department were completely deserted. Somehow the weather of the day, the time, the happening of the past weeks all combined to create an atmosphere of intrigue and conspiracy. Promptly at two, Mr. Auerbach drove up and we met for the first time. So they pitched the ideas of Jamaica, or, or the idea of Jamaica to him. Um, he said that he's, he was fine with it. Of course, approval would have to come from the British government for that, so they'd have to wait a few hours. And then Mr. Auerbach at this meeting raised the possibility, and of course you're all familiar with this term, of visa waivers, right, of visa waivers. Okay, and, and of course visa waiver, kind of like the term Becca, took its own life, you know, in the Cuban exile community. Uh, a visa waiver is literally what it says, it is a waiving of the visa requirement, right, that somehow because of an emergency situation, a person who wanted to travel from country A to country B could have that the visa requirement waived by the U.S. government to get them out quickly. The emergency, of course, was the indoctrination of children and the communist takeover and all of that. But Auerbach would have to get approval from a higher level than himself. So immediately, here were two avenues that were open. Uh, Jamaica and the visa waivers. Of course, most children are going to end up coming on the visa waivers, although several came through Jamaica as well. Um, but there were still questions, would the British, of course, approve Jamaica? Would the higher-ups at the State Department approve the visa waivers? And if they did, how, how, what form would a visa waiver take? I mean, they, they had to decide that. And, of course, would the Cuban government take those documents to allow people to leave because, because they required those? Anyway, meanwhile, Father Walsh busied himself calling the Archdiocese in Jamaica, uh, trying to uh, 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 get their support. and. That same day, or, or later that day, much later, uh, the British Embassy approved of the Jamaica visas, and of course the State Department had approved uh, the visa waiver plan. Now, of course, how the visa waivers would work, well, what does that mean? I mean, how do you waive a visa requirement and let the other government know, or whoever you need to go through, whether there or here, know that your visa requirement has been waived, right? Well, what they came up with, it was very simple. They gave Father Walsh blanket authority, blanket authority to issue visa waivers to any child between 6 and 16. Those who were up to 18, right, 16 to 18 would have to go through a security check. Um, but blanket authority. Now this was very different from waivers for adults because a lot of adults came on visa waivers too. But for the regular visa waivers, they'd have to, you know, they have to be a first degree relative in the United States. You have to fill out 100 forms. You'd have to, there's a whole process. This cut through that process. Uh, very, very quickly. Monsignor Walsh was given the authority that his signature would suffice to waive the visa requirement. All he had to do was type up a waiver on Catholic Welfare Bureau letterhead, his signature at the bottom, and the rest would be filled out in Cuba. So, now on the, on the meanwhile, um, Mr. Baker gave his Havana committee the green light to go ahead with the Jamaica plan, and of course, Father Walsh would handle the visa waiver plan. And it was really simple how it worked. I mean, it, when, when you think about it, it's like, wow, I mean, 14,000 parents had to wait for a letter from, from Father Walsh. No, you try the easiest way first. And Walsh sent in blank visa waivers, of course, with everything there except for the child's name, with his signature, about 12 of them. 
and waited to see if they were photocopied in Cuba, they were underground printers, right? If those photocopied uh, uh, visa waivers or, or his photocopy signature would be accepted by the Cuban authorities for them to leave. It was, they would be accepted here, they knew that already. And of course someone asked me uh, the other day, well, I, I mean, what, what legitimized the signature if it was copied? Well, what legitimizes anything? If the people in charge of approving it accept it, then it's legitimate. And of course, <laughs> most of those visa waivers had, you know, a, a, a copied signature. Anyway, within days, uh, the, the, the Catholic Welfare Bureau began receiving children with uh, visa waivers at Miami International Airport. The first group made it uh, to Jamaica. Walsh, by the way, never made it to his White House conference on the aging, uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> Anyhow, and again, we have to go through all this very quickly. If you want any follow-up questions, more detail, just ask me at the end. Um, but of course, now inside of Cuba, uh, there were three objectives to get the children out. Uh, first was to get the children or their families the exit documents. Secondly, money, because you had to purchase an airline ticket. And third, and it probably in, if, 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 the, if the audience wasn't made up of Cubans, I wouldn't have to explain why this was a challenge, but getting seats on airplanes. Right, because you know what that was like. Um, anyhow, uh, different networks were established in Cuba. Uh, remember, nobody in Cuba called it Operation Pedro Pan. This was a, an, an effort without a name, an effort with some structure, but it wasn't defined by structure. These visa waivers uh, were delivered en masse throughout Cuba. There, there, there's not a single method or, 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 or some careful control over how this happened. Um, in many cases, they were distributed uh, in large numbers to private schools, especially Catholic schools, of course, which were, are going to be open for a few more months, to the vast underground networks in Cuba, to clergy, local uh, um, former politicians, right? There were all sorts of people that you could get them from if you knew the right people. But there were other methods, too, uh, concerning these visas. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of phony visas were made, not visa waivers, but visas to Jamaica. Um, por la Grau, you know, told me how she would sit up late at night with a group of people making fake uh, visas to travel to Jamaica. There was another method that, that most people don't know about, and I was very lucky to find it because I happened to, one of the people who did this, I, I've known them my whole life. Um, if you didn't have a visa waiver, you could still leave on a visa waiver without having one, if you knew how to do it, and it only lasted for a few months before the Cuban government shut it down. Which was, if there was a visa waiver in your name at Miami International Airport, someone here could go to Miami International Airport, put a visa waiver in Jose Perez's name. Now, the airline in Miami would write to the airline, and, and, and they had a plane ticket too, to, to their offices in Havana, said, Jose Perez has a visa waiver in Miami. They would have that on file. Then the airline in Havana would write a letter, right, Jose Perez has a visa waiver in Miami. And you could use that letter, saying you had a visa waiver in Miami, to buy your airplane tickets and leave the country. This only lasted a few months, but you know you did what you could when you can do it. Um, at any rate, some of the people, and, and well, a couple more things. Of course, the money was always a challenge. There was no centralized system to do this. At first, of course, the businessmen who helped Mr. Baker, but after that, people sent Father Walsh money in the mail, relatives who were in Miami, there were a million different ways. You needed $25. Um, and in Cuba, $25 was harder to get at this time than you can imagine. At any rate, um, just to go a little bit through the operation inside of Cuba, like I said, one of the most difficult things I had trying to piece this together was, you know, you're always looking, especially I was a much younger historian then and much more literal. I was looking for this structure, this organizational flowchart of Operation Pedro Pan inside of Cuba. <laughs> there wasn't one. It was an evolutionary process. It, it happened across the board in different places at different times. But just to mention a few things, uh, Mr. Baker's group, um, his five-person group, that really started this and, 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 and set up the system, uh, Pancho Finlay and his wife, uh, Berta de la Portilla, <clears throat> were connected to Rust, and they were key figures in all of this. Pancho was the uh, general manager for KLM, the Dutch National Airlines, uh, for Cuba and the Caribbean. Uh, he secured uh, places on KLM flights, not just for children, but for a lot of adults as well. Um, he used his contacts with Pan Am uh, to, to, to have them cooperate. He and his wife used their contacts at the British Embassy, the Dutch Embassy, the private schools, 
They distributed countless thousands of visa waivers, uh, and it's estimated, and this number comes from the Operation Pedro Pan Group from many years ago, um, that they were responsible for aiding 5,000 children who left Cuba. Probably 4,900 of those 5,000 children have no idea that the Finlays were responsible um, for, their, for their rescue. Um, Sergio Hiquel and his wife, um, um, Serafina Lastra, also friends of the Bakers, involved since the inception, running messages between Miami and Havana early on, distributing visa waivers, British visas, all the same thing. And of course, someone uh, with whom I had a conversation about this morning, uh, Penny Powers, uh, who for some of us remains kind of enigmatic. Uh, we know something about her. She was British. Uh, she's listed as an English teacher at Ruston, although Chris and I were talking about this this morning, and he doesn't recall her teaching at Ruston, but uh, she was definitely connected in one way or another. <clears throat> and of course, um, she had experience in child refugee movement. She was part, um, at least I'm told, of Operation Kinder Transport in, in getting uh, unaccompanied Jewish children out of uh, German-occupied Europe during World War II. She was the main contact with the British Embassy and many other embassies as well, distributed visa waivers, smuggled out underground operatives, used all her networks um, to help get the children out. Um, she, again, she was a British citizen, so accessing, finding out her role is a little bit different because she wasn't under the same pressure to relocate in Miami later. In fact, she stayed in Cuba. And Chris told me this morning opened an international school for the children of diplomats and all that, but she certainly was, was a main figure. And a lot of this started happening before the Bay of Pigs invasion, but the problem was not for the five on the Baker Committee, but for a lot of the underground network that was distributing these visa waivers was the events of the spring of 1961. You had the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, and that had the effect of destroying many of the underground networks. New ones would rise in their place. But it wasn't just the failure of the Bay of Pigs that was so important. I call it the, the trifecta in the spring of 1961. You have the failure of the invasion. Practically during the invasion, Castro finally announces that he's a Marxist-Leninist. And at around that time, all the private schools were shut down. Some during the invasion, never to reopen, and others soon after. Anyhow, so everything changed and in many ways, but other people stepped up, um, uh, Mongo Grau and his sister uh, uh, Paula, um, through Penny Powers. They were the niece and nephew of Ramon Grau San Martin, a former president. They had a little bit more freedom of movement because they were who they were. Um, they, and for year and for months helped distribute visa waivers, produced phony visa, distributed airline tickets, money. Again, they all had their underground networks. It wasn't that they were bringing them to you personally, but they were the ones, and they may have, but they had many people working under them who did. Both of them, brother and sister, were arrested in 1965. Uh, Polita was in a political prison until 1979, and Mongo until 1986, I had the good fortune of, of talking to both of them before they passed away. But there were hundreds of people involved, diplomats, teachers, clergy. We'll never know the number. Anyhow, do I still have time? Or no? Yes? You sure? Okay. You tell me, do this, or this, like I'm getting hungry, because I'm smelling the food and everybody else is too. This is about the time when my students start pulling out bags of chips. So, hurry up, please. Anyhow, um, getting back uh, to Miami very quickly, um, John F. Kennedy became president. Now, we're going back a little bit. Um, in early 1961. And of course, now, now of course he was dealing with the Cuban situation in real time. Uh, the invasion was being planned, the Cuban refugee problem in Miami. So he's going to deal with it a little bit differently than Eisenhower did. Eisenhower sent the special representative, Tracy Voorhees. Um, President Kennedy is going to send the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Abraham Ribikoff, to check out the situation in Miami. And so Ribikoff made his trip. Uh, during that trip, Father Walsh got to talk to him, and they knew what was going to be established, and they had an idea that a comprehensive Cuban refugee program was going to be developed, which did everything from care for unaccompanied Cuban children to retrain Cuban doctors. It was the big program, that, that um, um, uh, running the Cuban Refugee Center, everything. And Walsh spoke to him about possibly tying uh, the Cuban children's program to the overall Cuban refugee program, which would be very good because it would permanently bind the federal government to provide money for the care of children. That was still a little bit up in the air. Nobody quite knew how this was going to be paid for. Anyhow, Secretary Ribikoff reported back to the administration. There were a number 
of points. There were a number of, of recommendations. Among them were point number eight, quote, providing financial aid for the care and protection of unaccompanied children, the most defenseless and troubled group among the refugee population. And of course, that all those points, I think it was like 10 of them, resulted in the, in the Cuban refugee program, of which now uh, the Cuban children's program uh, became a part. Now, just some very uh, unamusing, unentertaining, uh, legalistic things and how they did it. The federal government's gonna fund the Cuban children's program through the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. That, talk about organizational flowcharts. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare gave it to their Children's Bureau, so it's still in the federal part. The Children's Bureau of the department then contracted the Florida State Department of Public Welfare. So the federal government was going to give the money to the Florida State Department of Public Welfare. They became the agents. The Florida State Department of Public Welfare then subcontracted the private religious agencies in Miami to, to provide the actual care. Of course, these were um, Walsh's uh, Cuban, uh, oops, Cuban um, Catholic Welfare Bureau, uh, the Children's Service Bureau, which were taking Protestant children, and the Jewish Family and Children's Service of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation uh, for the Jewish children, as well as the United Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was a large umbrella organization devoted to Jewish resettlement, uh, etc. Um, and the private agencies would provide the actual care, but custody remained with the parents of Cuba. But Walsh's three goals were met. The children's religious heritage was protected, licensed child care organizations, would be providing care and public money would be secured. And the public money part was important because it made it permanent, right? They know they could plan when they had that guarantee. Anyway, all this happened in the nick of time because this is early 1961 because that, that trifecta, that hat trick, whatever you want to call it, was soon to occur. And when that occurred, this thing exploded. And again, those were almost all at the same time. In some cases, all on, within a couple of days, depending what's cool. But the Bay of Pigs invasion, Castro's official announcement that he was a Marxist-Leninist, okay, and the closing of the schools. It all happened right there, right in the spring of 1961. Of course, some schools, uh, Belen, for instance, was closed when the invasion started, and they never reopened. A few of the other schools reopened for the remainder of the school year, but were shut down at the end of the school year. Anyhow, this thing, as we know, um, it's going to bring 14,048 children over that we know of. The number could be a little higher, a little less. Uh, about half of them required care. Half of them required care. Now remember, so you got two things. You have Operation Pedro Pan, which was not the official name. That was a, a name invented by the press later. Okay, and the official Cuban Children's Program. They were both, they, they were born of one another. They were born together. Uh, the Cuban Children's Program wouldn't have come into existence maybe the way it did if it were not for Pedro Pan. But remember, the Cuban Children's Program was separate. It, 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 it was its own entity. And it will be open until 1981, right? Even though most of the Pedro Pan children were long gone by then, it continued to accept unaccompanied Cuban minors until 1981. We were talking about until the Reagan presidency here, so it lasted for a long time. Uh, but the program went through many revolu evolutionary changes. I'll just go by a few that you're all very familiar with. Uh, I discussed this with groups that don't know anything, so I'll be more quick with you. Um, you know that the children arrived at Miami International Airport. They were met by Catholic Welfare Bureau officials. Uh, at, at one point, the head of all that became uh, George Walsh. Right? In fact, there was a point, at least I'm told, that the children were told. And, is he here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, it got to the point, and I've interviewed many of uh, Pedro Pena, where they were told in Havana, ask for George. Who's George? I don't know, just ask for George. Right? He's the one you gotta ask for. And of course, he also made the great contribution of, of keeping a record of the children as they came, where they lived, their names, etc. And, and of course, that, that record uh, still exists. And, 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 and it was George, and it was several other, uh, Margarito Teisa, and, and a whole bunch of people with these station wagons and whatnot who would meet the children. Now, if the children got there, as you know, if they had a relative waiting for them, they went with that relative. If they had no one, at the height of the program, they were taken to the Remember, this, this changed. First there was this camp, then these two camps, and these three camps, and these camps. So it's hard to say this is how it worked, because it, it, it changed a lot. But at the height, height, height of the program, this is how it worked. Of course, if they were Jewish or if they were Protestant, 
those agencies were contacted because they didn't always, again, because the numbers were so small, they didn't necessarily have someone every day like the Catholic Welfare Bureau, which took on something like 90% of the cases, but they were immediately contacted, they immediately took charge of the child. The rest who went to the camp, um, the, the camps really became transit centers. Uh, Father Walsh didn't know, I mean, some of these camps, you guys lived through them, I didn't, but I'm told a lot of them were packed. I mean, people, you know, that there was just no more room, so there was a lot of pressure to move these kids along because Father Walsh didn't know if the next day a thousand more were going to show up. And so um, they were temporary. And of course, as you all know, Father Walsh uh, enlisted the support of agencies around the country through Catholic Charities. More than 95 licensed child care agencies in 35 states, but the Catholic Welfare Bureau remained in control where they were, how they got there. They had a whole system devised of how they would get on the planes. It was all extremely organized. The children, as you know, were sent to a variety of situations, to foster homes, boarding schools, some to orphanages, group homes supervised by Cuban clergy because a lot of the, um, the, the camps were uh, manned by Cuban clergy and other Cubans, and there were a lot of Cuban religious orders who were exiled too. So they said, well, why don't, you know, for instance, in the case of uh, uh, Albuquerque, right? You know, we'll take this group of Cuban Marist brothers and we'll send them to Albuquerque. They, they've given us, a, you know, some facility there. Um, and they took, you know, X number of boys and they established a home for them there. Uh, so there were a lot of situations. Um, as you know, there was the Kendall Camp, which, of course, at its height was for boys between 12 and 14. Camp Matagumbe for boys 15 to 18 in Florida City for all the girls and the boys to age 12. There were also very quickly two permanent homes established in Miami during this time for teenage boys. Teenage boys were the hardest ones to place. I'm not sure why, um, <laughs> but they were. There was not only that problem with teenage boys, but remember, a disproportionate number of Pedro Pan children were teenage boys. I forget the percentage, but the percentages. I, I was even shocked when I saw it. Uh, I said, wow. And again, it was a whole thing of the draft, of getting in trouble, all of that. Um, so there was that problem, and they were hard to place. Uh, and of course, a few of them who were placed got set back uh, by their caretakers. Um, and also, Monsignor Walsh wanted to establish a showcase to inspire other Catholic dioceses to come check out the permanent home for boys and maybe open one in their diocese for Cuban boys as well, which actually happened. The homes were more of a home environment. There were two. Uh, the first one, some people called it the Ferre House because uh, the, the later mayor of Miami donated it. Casa Carrion, Cuban Boys Home, officially St. Raphael's. Um, it, it started out as a reception center for boys and later turned into a permanent home. Uh, Mr. Baker served as the house father there for a short time. But these boys lived there permanently. They went to school in Miami. They had part-time jobs. Uh, Father Walsh lived there uh, with them. And it was a group of around 80 boys. The other one, uh, the Jesuit Boys Home, or, or White Hall, was opened and administered by Cuban Jesuits uh, who came, they opened Belen in Miami and these were I think for the most part unaccompanied adolescent Cuban boys who were going to Belen and so they, they, they gave them charge of that. Anyway, eventually um, it wound down. Um, when the Cuban Missile Crisis came as you all know in October 1962 all the commercial flights between Cuba and the United States stopped. Operation Pedro Pan pretty much ended um, and so the number of children coming over was a lot less. It created less of a burden on, on the Catholic Welfare Bureau, but also it kept a lot of children separated from their parents a lot longer than they would have been otherwise. But from the Catholic, um, from the Cuban Children's Program uh, point of view, this meant that there was a lot less pressure to relocate the children to other parts of the country. So the children who were in Miami at that time, a lot of them ended up staying at these camps permanently since there was no longer the need to be moving them around the country to make room. Um, Kendall closed in 1962. Uh, Dade County asked for the return of its facility because they're the ones who donated it. Uh, Father Walsh arranged for the, for the, for the boys there um, to be moved to, uh, to an unused U.S. Marine barracks at the Opelaka Airport. They were moved there the next year. Um, there, Cuban Jesuits were put in charge of Opelaka. Uh, of course, Whitehall, the Jesuit boys' home, was also closed, and the boys moved there, and Matacumbe and St. Raphael's, these are all the boys' homes, uh, whoever remained there was also moved uh, to Opelaka. Um, the girls in Florida City were moved to a home uh, somewhere near US-1 where it remained until the end of the program. Now we know when the freedom flights began, a lot of, 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 of reunifications came. We know that um, the uh, parents who had children uh, in the United States were given priority. So by mid-1966 there were only 500 children left nationwide, only a handful of them in the Miami centers. 
Opelaka got too big, and so in the summer of 1966, the boys in Opelaka were moved to a home on Southwest 8th Street near Brickell Avenue, where they were under the care of a Jesuit priest who, for those of you who grew up in Catholic circles in Miami, whether you went to Belen or you didn't, I went to Columbus. Although I did do eighth grade at Belen. And I remember this person because he's the person I like. I'm talking 1980, 81. I was at Belen many years after. Uh, Luis Ripoll. And Father Ripoll, I'm sure a lot of you know him, was put in charge of that, of that home on Brickell Avenue and 8th Street. And then in 1970, they were moved again, this time uh, to a home on, in uh, Miami Shores where it lasted until 1981. By this time, all the Pedro Pan children, uh, of course, were over 18. At Edmuna. But a few precedents before I end. First, this is the first time Cuban Children's Program, the federal government funded <coughs> private agencies uh, to, to, for the care of refugee children. It revolutionized, and you can read more about this in, you know, in, in other places, financial organization in social services. Many of the methods were outdated. The Cuban Children's Program revolutionized finances and social services. It was one of the first times that interracial um, uh, foster care situations occurred. Uh, some of the children were Afro-Cuban, some were Chinese, and of course that's been written about. And of course the whole idea of small group homes, like the one Monsignor Walsh established, were also present. Okay, um, just I think just a, um, a couple points. Um, Carlos mentioned that there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of people out there that are, are, are bashing the program. Um, it almost sounds like they received a briefing in Havana and, and were dispatched to the United States after. Let's, let's see how we can best twist this into something really perverse. Um, so beware of that, beware of that. Um, and, and, and I would have liked to have spoken more on, on what occurred inside of Cuba and the motives of the parents. But just remember one thing, everything the parents predicted was going to happen happened, and maybe even worse. <laughs> maybe even worse than they could have imagined. Uh, they say, well, there was a rumor that, you know, that they were going to take away parental authority. And Dr. Clark mentioned, I quote him, that what he said up here on the board, he told me, and it's in my book, I got like three paragraphs on, on that view, that, that Patria Potata was taken away. You had no control over your children's lives. Right? It was taken away in sort of a de facto manner. They didn't need to pass a law. It's a dictatorship. You do whatever you want. Right? Also, well, well, children were never sent to Russia. Well, first of all, some were. But that aside, they didn't have to send the children to Russia. The Soviet Union was brought to Cuba for them. Right? It was brought for them. So, um, you know, like God knows, I'm constantly, I was, you know, fighting, you know, arguing. I, I, I tend not to like to get into it, whether it's about the Bay of Pigs, uh, on my second book or on this because it just gets frustrating after a while but you have to you know re-energize yourself and uh, you know email somebody who you know is going to be supportive I was I was asked to be on a on a on a radio program of all places in, in Ireland um, I was at my home in Middletown Connecticut on a very bad phone connection in Ireland was the host and in the studio in Dublin and three Irish communists and I couldn't get a word in edgewise and, and I'll end with this, just to show you what, what we're up against when we're asked to do these things. This is a great environment. Everybody agrees with me. Um, I mean, I feel great. Uh, but one of the people on the show, some expert on Cuba, uh, had the audacity to say, and I quote, Cuba is a democracy. It's just a different type of democracy. I'm thinking, damn right. <laughs> I've never seen a democracy like that. So, you know, get your point of view out there. Get your stories. Interview your parents. Uh, because, you know, this isn't only about reminiscences, but uh, there is a fight over history about this, about the Bay of Pigs invasion, about everything. And people want to own history, right, and their version to be out there. And, and so I think it requires all of us, even though I wasn't on Pedro Pong, I didn't have any relatives who were on it, but I feel myself very much a part of the, of the struggle to get the point of view out there. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Am I up next? Oh. Yeah. yeah, I just have to go up the steps again because I'm on next. Welcome. Uh, my name is Victor Triay. <laughs> and 
Todman asked me um, to say a few words about Monsignor Walsh. And actually, we spoke about this. We really did. Uh, and about uh, Mr. Baker. And, and it was a conversation. And of course, I completely forgot. Um, I was so concerned with my talk. And then a couple days before I flew, I actually took a look at the programs he'd sent me many things earlier. And I had to send her an email. I said, did I miss the memo on this? <laughs> And she said, no. We, I said, oh my God, that's right. That's right. That's right. But I was lucky. It was good, because I think if I would have tried to think of this uh, earlier, I probably would have come up with something uh, maybe a little bit less heartfelt. So I actually put this together. I was up very late the night before I left, uh, thinking about this, and also about Mr. Baker. Um, I mean, what can one say about Monsignor Walsh? I remember when I met him, of course, I'd heard of him. When I started researching Operation Pedro Pan, he was still working at the time. Those of you who knew him, he was a strong guy. I got, I got an interview with him. I was like, wow. So I went to his office, and of course, he was on time, and fortunately, so was I, which is not typical. Um, he very curtly, but courteously, put me into a chair in his office, and he kind of just looked at me with a, go ahead, you're on the clock, type look. <laughs> and, and, and I liked that, because I knew right away this was a person that didn't waste his time, and a person not to be trifled with. And, and, and he gave me actually a great, great interview. Many of the quotes I read you were from uh, that interview. And of course we became, uh, you know, I, I guess you can say friends later. We talk on the phone, um, go out to lunch. You know, we went out to lunch a couple times uh, when I was working on, on other things. But I remember, you know, there was a question someone put to me once, very innocently, when talking about Operation Pedro Pan. And they asked me, well, what motivated him to do this? I forgot who it was who asked me this, but I, but I was stumped. I was like, I, I never thought about that. <laughs> because, you know, I, there, there, there's always a motive, I guess, for doing things. And of course, if you're a historian, then you have to look that this served some sort of personal need um, that the person had. And I, I, I thought about it, and I gave some answer, but then I, I, I kept thinking about it. And, and I went back to the last time I saw him, we went out to lunch, and I had this great idea. I wanted to write a biography about him, right? That was going to be my next book. Uh, and we were having lunch somewhere in South Miami, and of course I had to sum it up my courage. I didn't know how he would react to it, if he would be offended or whatever. Um, that, you know, someone, you know, a peon like me would have the audacity to write, you know, a biography about him. Uh, or if he would jump, I, I, I didn't know. So um, I bounced the idea off him, right? And of course by this time, I, the Pedro Pan book had come out, the Bay of Pigs book was coming out. And I asked him, and you know, and waited, and he kind of did this. <laughs> I was like, "Wow!" Uh, because if that was me, if someone came to me and said, "I want to write a biography of you," I'd be like, "Really? Well, let's let's sit down. <laughs> Let me start from the beginning." Um, but he was so unpretentious. He was he was for all his greatness, for all his fighting, he was one of the the humblest people uh, I ever met. I mean, he's a giant of a man, loved and revered, a potential saint in, in my mind, who kept his humility at all times. Such is true, true greatness. Uh, the biography never got written because unfortunately he passed away before anything became of that. So what motivated him? What made him care for these children? What made him to continue fighting for Haitian refugees, for the elderly, against segregation? In short, for the most vulnerable and disenfranchised members in his community. who made him brandish his sword constantly to fight for the flock he'd been given to protect. At the risk of sounding horribly naive and innocent and, and you know, whatever, impressionable, uh, I think I know what motivated him. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, th I don't think I am. Um, I really do believe he lived his faith. He lived his, uh, his priestly calling. He lived his vocation, right? He lived the central teaching, Christ's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount that we find in the book of Matthew. And of course, later in the book of Matthew, uh, we find another instructive passage whose moral, I believe, is maybe the central message of Christianity. And I think maybe, maybe, I don't know, because I never asked him what motivated you. I'm just speculating here what may have motivated him to do this. And this is from, you've all heard this, but maybe in this context it'll sound a little bit different. Uh, it's from the book of Matthew. Quote, the king, said, uh, um, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. 
Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you uh, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Naive to view him this way as a motivating factor? Maybe, but I do believe this is what motivated him somewhere deep down inside. He wasn't pretentious enough maybe to come out and say it, but I do think that that's what was inside. He was one of the most genuine people I'd ever met, a man, a man of unimpeachable character and devotion to his priestly vocation, a man who was a humble servant of God, serving and fighting for the humble, vulnerable flock God had given him, and fight he did, and the product is in this room today and out throughout that city that you see. And of course, he has the well-deserved title of the patron saint of Operation Pedro Pan and uh, maybe one day of saintliness at even a higher level. Let's hope. Anyway, it's my great pleasure then um, to introduce um, uh, Dermot O'Brien and Royzen Ferry, Monsignor Walsh's niece and nephew.